start recording. Awesome. So, um, good, good evening. This is evening. Jeff with the Creative Coast, <laughs> and we are uh, celebrating Entrepreneurs Night uh, from our home this week, uh, uh, this month, and probably next month, realistically, due to COVID-19. And today, I'm really excited to have as our guest, Jesse Blanco with Eat It or Like It, like it. Um, and uh, Jesse Blanco Productions, actually, is probably That's right. a company. DBA. DBA. Right? <laughs> and, um, so uh, I'm thrilled to actually have him with us so that he can tell us a story about launching his media company. And I think there's probably a lot of people thinking that, um, you know, they might want to start a media company in this uh, craziness that we're experiencing right now. And, and lessons learned from you might be able to help them think about how to do it the right way. So... Jesse, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, my name is Jesse Blanco. I am a uh, host of, uh, of a weekly TV show called Eat It and Like It. Um, and and uh, uh, CEO, if you will, of the supporting website, eatitandlikeit.com. Uh, I'm a journalist by trade. Um, graduate of the University of Central Florida. Always wanted to be a news anchor wound up being a sports anchor, which is what originally brought me to Savannah in 1999, April, right about now of 1999, uh, I first moved to Savannah and um, did sports and then eventually did news for uh, 19, 20 something years or whatever. And um, got an opportunity to, uh, to, to transition my hobby into um, this media company and it was a good idea at the time. And we thought, you know, this will be fun to do for a while. And it was so popular right out of the box that um, we thought, okay, we'll run with this. And then three years later, uh, four years later, maybe Savannah's food scene exploded. So we knew it was at that point that we needed to give up the day job if we really wanted to make this what it could be. And so I did kind of pushed myself off Niagara Falls in the kayak and it's been hair on fire ever since. So, um, but you know, not to be too cliche, but if you, if you find something you love to do, you won't work a day in your life. So what year did you start the company? And then when was that, that the Savannah food culture? Um, we started discussing it. The idea was hatched out on Tybee at Doc's bar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> true story uh in may of 2010 we spent the summer i say we my business partner and i um discussing what it could look like um and we started building a website the first iteration of the website you know you start calling in favors from friends blah 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 and uh, we, we rolled that out in October and it kind of really wasn't functional. And then we called in some more favors from friends. And uh, the birth date that I called for Eat It and Like It officially was February 3rd of 2011, okay. uh, which is actually Facebook's birthday as well. And so um, we started the website, it exploded February 3rd. Um, the plan was if we can get some traction with this blog, which is all it was about food in Savannah and Hilton Head, um, that we would eventually follow it up with a television show. And right after St. Patrick's Day, we started February 3rd, right after St. Patrick's Day, six weeks later, I saw traffic going down. Um, there was clearly interest, but it wasn't like it was throughout February. And so I got impatient and um, said, we're doing a TV show. And we spent some time over the summer, not impatient, but it still took six, eight months, whatever. And September 24th of 2011, a Saturday morning at 7.30 a.m., the TV show premiered on WJCL, which they made me buy time even though I was an employee. What are you gonna do? So that was fe September of 2011. And I say that the food scene in Savannah exploded summer of 14. Uh, summer of 14 was when Pachi opened at the Bryce, Collins Quarter opened, 
the Florence opened, which was a big deal because it was Celebrity Chef, Beard Award winner, you know, Hugh Atchison and all of that. Um, and then December of that same year, uh, 14, was when the Gray opened. Um, and so you could argue from that point forward, summer of 14 was when everything that we're seeing now kind of started. That's interesting. I didn't know that. I knew when the yeah. Gray opened, but I didn't know that. I hadn't thought about the other places. Yeah. That they all opened in the summer within about two months of each other. And then the Gray opened like three days before Christmas of 14. Awesome. So yeah. um, talk about, so that's kind of the origin story of how it ended and like it got off the ground and how yeah. you transitioned from kind of TV personality to media company founder. Yeah. About the business model. How do you guys make money? <laughs> Well, in non COVID 19 times, how did you make money? <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? Um, well, it's, it's very important. And, and now, almost 10 years later, it, 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 the word has gotten out and people understand. But it was very important to me. I was a news anchor, I was the, the 10 o'clock p.m. Uh, news on Fox here, anchor of the news. And like I said a few minutes ago, I, I was a journalist my whole career. When, when my business partner and I sat literally at B. Matthews on a summer morning, July morning, and we scratched out all of this insanity on a few napkins, um, we, we, we made two or three things perfectly clear that day. Um, this blog would be about more than Savannah and Hilton Head. It would be about the South. Reason being, if we only focused on Savannah at the time, we'd run out of material in five months. Same with Hilton Head. And we thought that, there, that, that the South didn't have enough um, lights being shined upon the, the you know, culinary diversity. Gotta understand, now everybody's talking about it, but this was 2011, nobody was talking about it. And so, um, you know, yeah, there's fried chicken. Yeah, there's fried green tomatoes. Yeah, there's, you know, whatever. But we also wanted to bring to the forefront people who were doing creative stuff and modern food. So it was going to be about more than Savannah, which people still don't get that, but okay. But the biggest one for me as a journalist was my opinion would never, ever, ever, ever be for sale. And for years and years, people thought that people paid to be on my show. And that has never happened. Never, ever happened. Um, it would be, it would have been easy. I'd have been driving a Range Rover right now if we were selling our airtime, but then I thought you lose credibility. If I tell you this is the best fried shrimp you ever had and you go and it's terrible, well, then how long is that payday going to last? And that was important to me to maintain the integrity. And it took a couple of years. It took a few years for for uh, for the business community to catch on that you know you can't just say hey Jesse I want to be on your show well, it doesn't work that way how do we get on your show well email me tell me about you and I'll send somebody to go eat there if it's good I'll go eat and if it's really good then if your story fits what we're trying to do then we'll talk about it I've had plenty of great food from places that have never been on the show it's nothing personal it's just you know. Vicks on the River is one of the most popular restaurants in Savannah. Never, never seen 10 seconds on my show. I love Vicks. It's one of my favorites in the city. It just, we haven't gotten to it for whatever reason. And that may sound um, incredibly arrogant, but everybody knows Vicks is great. So when I'm ready to, when we are ready to tell the story about the history of Vicks and all of that, we'll do it. But I don't need, you don't need me to sit there and tell you, Go to Vicks and try their, you know, crispy scored flounder. Everybody knows that. But there's no value in that. So um, that was number two. I would not be paid for my opinion. And um, I, I forget what number three was, but there was a number three. So to answer the long, the long answer to your question about the business model was advertising and commercials. Um, <clears throat> uh, the show was popular out of the box within two weeks, uh, literally two weeks of the show airing. I was at Kroger downtown here where I live and I had this little old lady say, what you cooking today? And I looked and it, it stunned me because I've been in TV my whole career. I know that it takes people 
a hot minute to put things together. Like, yeah, I know him from the news, but he's cooking too. Huh? And this lady said, what are you cooking today? And the show had been on twice. And so I went, oh, okay. And so um, commercials, day one. Um, and then <clears throat> later on, man, it took about six years, which it makes me laugh because it takes a second and a half to say six years, but it takes 50 years to live six years. <laughs> <laughs> and six years or so later, I would guess, um, we started being able to monetize appearances and um, uh, endorsements and stuff like that. So, um, but again, for six years, it was just inventory in the show and, and on the website. So that is the business model. It's, uh, it's primarily advertising, but some of our bigger deals include advertising and appearances and um, outside the box promotion, if you will. And do you manage all that, those relationships yourself or do you <clears throat> help with that? Um, I, I primarily, my business partner, um, she was here for the first, I don't know, six years, seven years. She moved to Nashville. She needed a break from Savannah. She wants to come back, but um, there hasn't been the right opportunity for her to come back. But um, so primarily, yes, because I'm here because I know everybody and everybody knows me. And so, um, yeah, I would say easily 95% of the relationships are, are me with whoever, which kind of is, is a challenge, but. That's a lot. You're yeah, like, it is. I haven't content. found the right person to help me along with that. You're, you're both the content creation engine and the business person right now. That's got to be really hard to juggle your day. <laughs> <laughs> you got it all right there. Don't <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, you add to that, I'm a father and a husband. And, you know, for the first uh, three years, I had five jobs. Um, I was writing for the paper for free, but it was content. I mean, it was a job, even though I wasn't getting paid. I was writing for the paper. I was working part-time weekends at WSAV. I was doing um, the production and I was uh, doing sales. So I was doing it all. And then you, you, you want to go to the big football weekend in October with your family and you realize you can't get all of the jobs off. <laughs> so um, in fact, I just saw a Facebook memory um, about 10 days ago, a week or so ago. It was from four years ago where I posted a picture of me and my family in St. Augustine. And what I wrote was, this is the first time the three of us have vacationed together in, in three and a half years. <clears throat> now, I'd gone places with my daughter or with my wife, but never the three of us for three and a half years. Um, and so there was a lot of sacrifice at the beginning to, to get this to where it is. Um, but now it's, it's, it's a little bit easier to be able to do stuff, so. And you do have, um, I'll call it staff. I don't know whether they're 1099s or employees, but you do yeah. have yeah. video production folks mm -hmm. and, and all that that support you today, right? <clears throat> yeah, there's, um, there's a rotating pool um, two or three here and there, um, whoever's available, uh, guys who, who I, I've shot with that know how we do stuff. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been great to have, um, those, those kind of guys around town. Um, video production is incredibly expensive. And, um, these are guys that, that, you know, I'm not taking guys, <laughs> I'm not taking guys, um, on 10, 12 hour shoots to, uh, and paying them a hundred bucks. You know, it's, it's not about that. Um, a full day can cost you $1,200. I don't hire these guys for full days. I hire them an hour here an hour there. Cause we're downtown Savannah or Hilton head and we knock stuff out quickly. It's, I got it down to a formula. Hey, we're going to interview this guy. We'll be there 90 minutes tops. So I can give them a couple of hundred bucks and they're grateful for the opportunity. So, um, 
so yeah, there's a few guys that that thankfully um, helped me out with that stuff because for years and years and years I did it all myself, and I still do some of it myself. What about social media and stuff? Is that you? Is that really you? <sighs> that is me. That is me. Um, we have tried. It, you know, it's interesting when the when the brand is a personal brand as well. Um, we have tried a few people over the years to help with that. And I have felt uncomfortable with the voice yeah. and, ev and everybody now finds, you know, the cute girl to help them with Instagram and all that stuff. But, and maybe I would benefit from making this more of a brand feel, but at the end of the day, I'm so incredibly protective of my voice that I can't get comfortable with anybody. Now, that's not to say I've gone through 10, 12 people, not at all, probably two in four years. Um, because it takes, it's, it's like, it's like kind of dating. I, I meet, I meet people and they do social media and, you know, I like them and you hang out with them a little bit and then you realize, yeah, I like her, but I don't know that I like her enough to marry her, if you will. <laughs> and so, um, I found a couple here and there that, that, that I've wanted to marry and, uh, and, and we work together here and there, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to work out. And maybe that's a, maybe that's a Jesse problem, a commitment issue thing. Um, but I haven't found the perfect fit yet. And I had one young lady, I love Alex. Um, she, uh, she was going to start with us when the, the apple cart, got flipped over um and so we'll see where we go when when we get the apple cart right back up i am i am very blessed with uh creative coast and kate lance who's doing our social media but also yeah. just you know she's been with the creative coast on and off since like 2011 so she understands the brand in some ways better than i do right and um, so we've been really blessed there, but with my other hat, Startup Chicks, my nonprofit, I have the same issue as you. The voice is me. Like when you hear, when you look at a Startup Chicks post, it's my voice. And right. I, like, how do you find somebody to replicate that voice? And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tried, but just have always had issues. But it's, it's been, it's, I, I get that. It's really yeah. hard. It's, it's, it's <laughs> hard. If I post something to Instagram and I wisecrack or extension of your personal brand is really what's going on there correct if i if i wisecrack if i wisecrack um something on instagram about you know some 80s joke and everybody gets it or nobody gets it or whatever and then the next post is something that doesn't sound like the same person it's a joke about the office which i've never seen 10 seconds of in my life <laughs> you know and I get it. Or right now with the, with the tiger and all that nonsense, I, I, I just, I, you know, I, I need to reach a point where I get over it, but I'm not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about, you know, I think there's people that have built a blog and built podcasts and things like that and would love to get a show on television what's that process like <laughs> um well now um it's so much easier than it was when we started um you can buy time on any tv station um i did like i said a few minutes ago they made me pay for time 350 bucks per half hour and that wasn't even a discount even though i was an employee um so you do 10 episodes just your airtime alone is $3,500. Um, you know, at the end of the day, finding a good time slot is harder than getting your show on TV. It has to be, you know, it has to look good. It has to be, you know, well-made, but you think about, you think about, and I say this respectfully, you, you, you put on TV on Sunday mornings and some of those local church shows are nothing but, you know, a, a, an iPhone pointed at, at the, at the, um, alter and you know uh, they go and they talk for 90 minutes so and the churches pay for that time um, so getting a show on TV is, is not the challenge 
getting something that people want to watch is the bigger challenge. And I got lucky with food because everybody eats. But, you know, having a solid idea is far more important than where are you going to share that idea. Interesting. Good, good knowledge to drop there. Um, to talk a little bit about how you're managing with our current situation. <sighs> working with um, karma, being home every day. Yeah, um, your, you know. The people that you interview and the places that you showcase are on, they're furloughed and closed for the most part or doing curbside pickup, right? Yeah, and I'll be honest with you. Um, I think before we started recording, you and I were talking about, I, I spent two weeks trying to figure out what this was going to look like. And the plan was after discussing with a few people who know this area and the plan was, and I was ready to go out on a Wednesday morning. In fact, uh, might've been last week, eight days ago now, as we record this, I was going to go out and start talking to everybody um, who's doing takeout and what are your concerns and, you know, find a bartender who's been laid off, all that stuff. And that Tuesday night, I'll be very honest, I was um, laying in bed in the middle of the night thinking, you know, going out and interviewing people all over creation about their troubles is not the smartest idea for two reasons. Um, number one, it's dangerous. Um, I would clearly be exposing myself and then coming home and exposing my family to whatever it is I encounter out there. But number two, I thought it would send the wrong message. It would open me up to criticism, which, okay, whatever. But as, as what we like to call ourselves the voice of food in this area, um, you know, food journalism wise, we are the leader here. And, you know, I didn't think that sent the right message. And so I was up half the night hand wringing trying to figure out, well, then what? And I thought there's everybody on MSNBC and all of that and CNN, they're all doing the video interviews. I thought there's got to be a way for me to do, to, for me to talk to people um, easier and, and more responsibly. And so we pivoted to this whole yeah. thing as everyone has, and um, it has made our lives so much easier. I'm still going out. I was in Bluffton today uh, chatting with them about their, uh, it's not a farmer's market, but the farmers are parking there on Thursdays to sell to people, but it's not a farmer's market. Um, they were closed last month. So I am going out once a week, maybe, maybe twice. If I go out the second time, it's downtown with my daughter to get her to shoot what we call stand-ups for me. And there's no one around. It's just us. Um, but that's been the biggest pivot, trying to figure out how to um, tell these people stories without going to their place. Um, and we started posting them to social media. And I think I was mentioning to you earlier, um, four, four pieces. We started Saturday with barbecue. And I think we posted four, four pieces. Uh, today's Thursday. And I think by, by Saturday at, at seventh day, we'll be over 10,000 views for week one with no promotion. So I'll take that if that's going to be the model going forward, because then, um, you know, if we can bump that up to 15, 20 a week, um, I can start showing that to a potential sponsor out there and say, Hey, do you want to, do you want to support the eat local initiative? So, um, and make a few bucks where, you know, right now you can get a, anybody watching, you can get advertising with us at a discount. <laughs> I mean, you know, you don't want to fly an empty plane, so you, 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 you do what you can for as long as you need to. But I will be honest, when, when, when it all hit the fan that night of the president's address, March 11th, I sat up. I was at the Ford Plantation, actually. They had asked me to, to be a guest speaker there that night, and I got to stay overnight at Henry Ford's master bedroom. And so I, was, I was sitting there at the Ford Plantation. You ever been out there? Only once. Yeah. Okay, I was sitting up there in Henry Ford's master bedroom watching the president tell us that this was all going to happen. 
And I sat up and said, okay, this is real. And I, I pictured a scenario where I was going to be driving Uber. I was going to be, you know, applying for a job at Publix, whatever it took to get through this. Um, I was scared for three, four days. I told my wife, hey, whatever we need to do, I'm going to do it. I don't care because there's going to be another side and there's going to be need for a megaphone. So my phone will ring once we get through this. But for now, I got to do whatever I can to get to the other side. And so um, it was it was spooky, but uh, the phone actually rang about a week later and I picked up a couple of accounts. And so it kind of helped me come down a little bit, but you know, all you need to do is put on the news and no one knows when this is going to end. So you kind of got one eye on, okay, let me keep that application to stock boy at Kroger handy. <laughs> well, um, I applaud you, Thank you for telling these people's stories because they're, you know, these restaurant owners and these chefs, um, are the ones that's hurting most. I actually had a conversation with somebody today about the small business SBA PPP loan. And, and I, it was somebody that lobbies on behalf of the large tech companies in Atlanta and they want to go for these loans and they've been left out of going for these loans. And I said, they don't deserve these loans. These loans were not meant for them. These loans are meant so that main street can survive like the brick and mortar stores and, and these restaurants, they need these loans. They need the small business, the SBA, the dollars from the CARE Act to go to them so that they can survive these two months, three months, whatever, and, and you know get through and pay their people. Um, the tech companies, you know, get yeah. your investor to give you more money. But yeah, I was bank. I was bank homeless for a few days. Please go and get all that money. Then small. So my point to her was like, the reason a technology entrepreneur like a Candor, USA healthcare technology company, moves to Savannah, Georgia, is because of Main Street. Is because of Broughton. Is because of the shops on Broughton and the art galleries on Broughton and the restaurants on Broughton and the other streets. Right, because that tech entrepreneurs employees are millennials and Gen Z, and they want to bike to work and they want cool restaurants and bars to go to at night and cool art galleries and, and museums to go to and, and some kayaking and boating and other stuff too, but they want that full experience. And if Main Street shuts down because of this, and Main Street can't survive this, then I can't get a tech entrepreneur to move to Savannah because Savannah doesn't offer anything anymore. Correct. So I yelled at the lobbyist for the Technology Association of Georgia today <laughs> because we need to get the story out for these restaurant owners and those that are doing curbside. How do I know mm -hmm. where to order? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. How, I'm trying to order a different place twice a week. Mm -hmm that I'm mm -hmm. supporting our business. How do mm -hmm. I tip my bartender is no longer working, even though I'm like drinking at home, right? Can I tip my bartender? How do we do that? So yeah. I applaud you for working. Thank now. you. I've always, I, I, have, I have always wanted to tell that the little guy story, always. And, um, you know, there are so many people doing wonderful things. Um, that's, my favorite part of my job when I was doing news and sports was meeting people. And so it's still my favorite part of the job, meeting incredible people with incredible stories. And now we get to eat. <laughs> yeah, I sleep in Ford's bedroom on occasion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was about four Chardonnays in that night too. Ooh. It sobered um, me up real quick. My one you know, This is a, like, these, those next two become hard questions because I ask them of everybody that I interview and, and given our circumstances right now, it becomes different because the next question is usually, what has your biggest challenge been? And the answer might be right now, I, I don't know, but what has your biggest challenge been getting this business to where it was a month ago? Um, the biggest challenge was 
getting people to buy into an idea. And I say people, I'm not talking about sponsors. I'm talking about, um, you know, this wasn't a traditional beginning of a business. I didn't open up uh, a chocolate shop like Adam Taroni, um, who is a dear friend and, a, and, a, and an incredible talent. But, you know, to, to break this down to its nitty gritty, you make 10 pieces of chocolate and you sell them, you take the profit, you pay your bills, and then you make 12 and then you build a business. That's, you know, how it is. We had to sell this community on an idea, on a concept, on a lifestyle of eating good food. Um, and we, for the longest time and still to this day, get teased about that fancy food you eat. Um, because at the end of the day, and I might, I might catch a little bit of grief for this, but I believe it, you know, Savannah, for all of its progress, um, the, 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 the establishment, the, the nuts and bolts, the heart of this town is still a, it's still a peel and eat fried, peel and eat shrimp fried chicken town. Um, the masses are that. And so we've been able to survive and grow without, you know, um, settling for what the majority of the people eat the most. Um, you know, it's always been about creative food. It's always been about things that people might eat only on their anniversary. And so I had a chef, a very popular chef in this town about a year ago, text me out of the blue. I'm like, where did that come from? He said, man, this town wears me out. I have no idea how you make a living. Like, well, I know the audience. And that was my response. And he said, yeah, good answer. You know, you got to play the cover tunes if you're a band. But at the end of the day, we play our music and getting people to appreciate our music now 10 years later has been the biggest challenge because they do. And I get every day out in the street, people, you know, multiple times a day. Hey, love your show. Hey, love your blog. Hey, love, 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 love. But at the beginning, there was a challenge to get people to embrace foods that they may not normally eat or restaurants that they may not normally go to. It was brutal. <laughs> Get that a little bit. I'm in a similar position with technology. Yeah. Yeah. You got to convince people that this is good for them, even though they're used to doing it another way. And, and, you know, we're not telling people that you have to, you know, start eating quinoa four or five times a week, but guess what? If you never heard of it, try it. You're not going to die. It, you know, come on now. This is, this is a healthy thing. Eat it. Go to this restaurant and try this $14 dish because it's all these vegetables and, you know, so you that might, type of thing. You might like it. Correct. You might eat it and like it. Fool. So <laughs> next question is, what does success look like for you? Like, what's your end game here? What are you hoping to to get to with this? Oh boy, the end game and the um, and the definition of success, I think, are two two different uh, animals. I think you know, success. Let me hold up my my big inspiration board that you could buy a sharper image. Su success is not a destination; it's a journey. Um, <laughs> but I but I. <laughs> I believe that with every fiber of my being, because there have been there have been points along the way where I thought, "Ooh, we are so good right now," and then six months later, I'm like, "Uh, we got a problem here." It's 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 not about um, uh, 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 being at a point. You know, you could call this a success that I'm now doing this almost ten years later, and I can make my own schedule. And, um, you know, I'm respected in this community. At the end of the day, a lot of my motivation is respect of my peers. It's all I've ever wanted to do. Um, and, and so I could take those and call those a success. Even if this all ended tomorrow, it was successful. Um, you know, uh, when, <laughs> when we go on vacation, and we want to extend it by two days. And my wife who works for the school system says, I'm going to need to put in for those two days and hope to get them approved. I'm like, well, I can get my two days approved. 
Well, you get two days free if you do a story about them. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, <laughs> not that we haven't done anything. Uh, no, um, success is enjoying the ride. I'm good. I'm happy. Obviously, right now, everybody's kind of freaked out. But, um, you know, the personality that you see on social or on TV is me. There's no act. I'm having the time of my life. So I call that a success right now. Just got to go to work tomorrow and continue to live that success. Um, I would like to build this to something that will carry on to a next generation, um, whatever that looks like 10, 12, 15 years from now, um, and be done with it and enjoy retirement. I don't know. I, 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 I don't think so much. I crossed 50 year and a half ago. So you start thinking about, you know, what's next. But the, the whole motivation has been to enjoy it today and tomorrow and don't let end games motivate you. I'm motivated by being happy. And if I can be happy, then we'll see where this all is in five, seven, eight, nine, 12 years. I don't know. Um, my daughter's about to go off to college. So the dynamic here in the house is going to change a little bit you know, might offer me the opportunity to travel a little bit more for the show, whatever. I have no idea. But for now, it's all good. Awesome. Tips for any aspiring entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs that are watching this that want to start a media-centered company. I've gotten good. I was telling my business partner just this week, about three days ago, I've gotten good at uh, my BS detector is razor sharp when it comes to people, young and old, who have an idea, who want to be, who want to invent the next Uber of vacuum cleaners. You know, um, I am by no means Tony Robbins or Gary V or shout out to Gary V. That's my guy. Um, look forward to meeting him one day, but um, I'm, I'm none of those guys. But I know the brutality that is involved in building a business from day one. And there's no other way to put it, but it's brutality. Work when others play and work when you don't want to. And all of those cliches, they're all applicable. Um, so I see when people have an idea, but not the passion, you got to have the passion. If you don't have the passion and you think that this is going to make you, you know, a million dollars because you're cute and you go on Instagram, you better have hustle behind you. You better have desire behind you. You better have just the willingness to grind it out for three, five, seven, eight years if it's not working. I was, I was having a conversation. This goes back five years now maybe six, no, I'd say five, about halfway. And I was a little antsy. I was a little frustrated. And I was a little, um, I wasn't discouraged because I was still having fun or whatever. And it's the only time I've ever done this. But I, I, I made a call uh, to, to a lady who I consider a friend, a very sweet lady, always been good to me. And I said, hey, can I come and talk to you? Um, I need some advice about A, B, and C. And, uh, and she said, yeah, sure. Call me next week. I'll be home. Blah, 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 blah. And so I went and this was, this was Paula, this was Paula Dean. And I went over to her house, Wilmington Island. And, uh, I sat with her, just me and her in her kitchen and a squirrel that had fallen out of a tree in her yard and she was feeding it. It was pretty interesting. And I told her concerns that I had, things that I was experiencing and all of that. And she said, how long has it been? I said, oh, it's been about five or six years or whatever it had been at the moment. She said, Jesse, um, I worked with the boys and lady and sons for 12 years before everything changed for me. And that kind of has a, a way of making you go, you know, here you are getting impatient at five years and this lady who has accomplished all that she had accomplished um, to that point uh, paid dues for 12 years. And I thought, you know, I need to be quiet and go back to work because 
if you're good enough, something will happen. And if you're not good enough for something amazing like that to happen, hopefully you'll be good enough to pay the bills and make a living. And, um, and, and that's it. That's all you ever want to do. Like all musicians, these rock stars, all these big guys, you, you hear them say in interviews, you know, we just wanted to make enough money to pay for our bills playing music and, you know, get some girls or whatever. If you're an artist, it, it, the, the bright lights aren't the most important. Being happy is. And so when she put that in perspective for me, that she had been doing her grind for 12 years before anything changed, I was like, okay, just go back to enjoying your time and, and, and let whatever is going to happen, happen. So the tip is, you know, everybody wants everything quick, microwave society. And you think that because you have 10,000 followers on Instagram that you're going to, well, guess what? Everybody has 10,000 followers on Instagram. <laughs> um, you got to love it. You got to love it when you don't love it. <laughs> you got to love it when you hate it. And, um, and be well, that's my biggest tip. You got to have the passion. And you can find people who are smart to help you along the way, but you got to have the passion to love it all the time. I'm only working when my eyes are open. That's my biggest tip. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. I think <laughs> the persistence is really key, obviously, but also the willingness to take action, right? Yes. Especially right now, one of the things I'm talking to a lot of entrepreneurs and they're like feeling really stuck, right? And and the difference between those that make it through this time and the ones that don't is primarily about saying, okay, how can I serve? How can I help my customer? How can I help my constituents? How can I help my community move forward? And yep. just taking action. Yep. Yep. And not sitting there, you know, blaming, oh, I'd, I'd have been a millionaire by now and I'm, I'm being silly, but oh, I'd have, I'd have broken through right now if not for coronavirus or I'd have whatever, if not for, you know, Trump or I would have, if not for, no, at the end of the day, you, you, you will if, if you're wired to and you won't if you're not, regardless of any of the, the outside um, pressures or not. Well, that's all I got. So thank you for your time. Very good. Lisa, you got a question? Throw me a zinger. Yay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse, for sharing that. Very inspirational for me, having been in business 12 years. Um, you know, and I always hear that, you know, it took me 10 years to be an overnight success. So yep. <laughs> um, yep. very much resonated with me. But my question for you is because um, as a media company, and I've seen uh, like Gary V, like he started out um on tv you know, i had tv or whatever i know you are you still doing your tv show or has that yeah. been mm -hmm. pardon yeah. me yeah okay so yeah. the question is have you ever considered just going straight digital and not doing tv we well the short answer is yes but the long answer is why would i give up um an opportunity to reach that many people for free. I don't pay for my time with WTOC. We have a barter agreement. Um, okay, well, I, that, I didn't realize that because the last, yeah. when you talked before, you're paying for your time. Yeah. So. No, we have a barter agreement with WTOC. Um, they treat me like family. I'm, I'm honored to be part of that, that family. Um, and so, you know, to use the show as a marketing tool um, to promote the brand to their huge audience, Absolutely. But no, I don't, I don't pay for time there. So it's, you know, to go back to Gary Vee, if he were here right now and he, he you know, he poo poos TV all the time, but um, he poo poos TV all the time because of the, the enormous costs involved. Yeah. If, uh, if, if somebody told Gary Vee, Hey, we'll put you on TV every 30 minutes for free. He'd be like, sign me up. Cause he knows that there's value there. So. <laughs> I think going past, if you, if you're not, if you, there are traditional ways of, of, broadcasting and if you sure. can make that work budget wise or barter wise right. it, it makes sense to leverage every channel versus because I know so many people just do digital and I'm and I'm like I'm old school I go way back so I I get all the traditional marketing before we had digital I mean social and mm -hmm. I agree it's like I mean we have some amazing radio stations here in our mm -hmm. local area 
-hmm. And uh, there's a late, other opportunities where you don't have to go digital. So I'm, I'm thank you for sharing that because it, yeah. it does matter. And people it's all about to, value. Your perspective, yeah. It's all about value. I mean, if you can get a good deal on it, absolutely. Why wouldn't you? Oh, um, you know, if you can tell 20 people your story at the same time, why would you do it when you're only telling six? Uh, absolutely. So. Um, and I do love your show, and I tell everybody about it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, cool. Very good. Uh, Good Thank question. <laughs> Who's in here? I know you got dinner on the stove. I do. The king was over there. Uh, we'll close it here. Have a great evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Time. Uh, thanks for joining us. And and hope to see you in person. Soon. Yeah, I'll be I'll be around. And I and I just want to say what last thing I'll, I'll add to this is I'm I'm always an email away. If uh, if any uh, aspiring entrepreneurs um, or anybody who sees this you know has a question. Um, they can find me at tips at eatitandlikeit.com, like leave me a tip. Um, that email eventually gets to me. So, you know, I, uh, I know what it's like to, to, to want and dream. So I'm always glad to answer a question. So tips at eatitandlikeit.com. Again, thanks for all you're doing for our restaurants right now and, and for other entrepreneurs. So thank you. You See all you. have a good one. Talk soon. <laughs>